as far as this quarter is concerned. This quarter we have been looking at Psalms. With me here, I have uh, some of our fellow lesson teachers who would help me to go through the quartering. To my left is Brother Dan, and to my right is Sister Josephine, who is the Sabbath School Superintendent, and uh, I believe Brother Vincent will also join us shortly. So just to begin, I'll give this opportunity for each one of them to say hi to the church, and after that, we will have Brother Daniel give us an opening prayer. So we shall start with Sister Josephine. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. You're welcome to King God's house. Thank you. The next one is Brother Vincent. You can say hi. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Let us pray to the house of the Lord. We keep him in prayer. Thank you. So then Dan will greet us and give us an opening prayer. Good morning, church. Thank you so much for coming. And I hope we will be blessed on this Sabbath. Let us pray. For heavenly loving Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much for your loving care. And we thank you so much for your mercies. Today we are ending the quarter on the lesson that was talking to us on how to praise you and on how to be prepared for your second coming. How we pray, pray that today as we are continuing our lesson, that you may give us your Holy Spirit, that we may learn more from you. And more especially today, the day of your Lord's Supper, we pray that very special that Lord may consecrate us and you may prepare us to this table which is in front of us. Our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. As I've mentioned, we want to take a few minutes to basically remind ourselves. Upstairs, I'm told this mic is too loud, so you can turn it down. Okay, I think this this is better. This is better, it's not too loud. So this quarter. We have been looking at the book of Psalms, and I will take three minutes to remind ourselves the first three lessons, what we talked about. When we studied this lesson, the first thing that we talked about is, for you to understand the book of Psalms, you must know how to study the book of Psalms. And we were told the following, number one, the book of Psalms is a book of hymns. Number two, the book of Psalms records different experiences by different authors. Number three, for you to understand how to study the book of Psalms, you need to understand the themes and the style. And we were told, what are the themes of the book of Psalms? One is to praise the Lord. Number two is sometimes to lament Number three is to give the history, and the most important thing we were told there is that the book of Psalms is a prayer book, and the book of Psalms is basically about God. Whatever you read in the book of Psalms, it is all centered on God. It doesn't matter the different writers. The main protagonist in the book of Psalms is God. That's what we were told. We also told that different writers wrote the book of Psalms. And different them, from Moses to Solomon to Ethan to the sons of Korah to Asap to David, all of them wrote the book of Psalms. Now, the first lesson during that day, during that time, was about teach us how to pray, that we need to know how to pray. We can use Psalms as a prayer book. That was what we read. Pray at the difficult times. We read Psalms 44. Pray 
at difficult times. We talked about pray in times of despair. We read Psalms 22. We said pray between doubts. When you are in doubt, pray for hope. We read Psalms 13. And lastly, we were told that pray for restoration. Psalm 60. The other lesson for that, the third one for that quarter, was about the Lord reigns. What did we say about the Lord reigns? One, we said the Lord reigns because he is our creator. Psalms 8 and Psalms 100. The Lord reigns. God is the creator. Number two, the Lord reigns because God is our king. We read that in Psalms 97. Number three, we said the Lord reigns because the Lord is our righteous judge. We read that in Psalm 75. We also said the Lord reigns because God is a God of a covenant. The covenant he signed with Abraham remains true even to the present time. We read that in Psalms chapter 7 and Psalms chapter 105. And lastly, we said the Lord reigns because his law is immutable. God's law does not change. It is a permanent law, the same way the covenant is permanent. We read that in Psalms 25. So we we'll go and look at the next three lessons from our sister Josephine. We are reminding ourselves. Sorry about that. Uh, the reason why we are reminding ourselves is to have like a lick up to, cap, to capture and get our minds uh, what we have. On lesson four, I know you have lessons. It says the Lord hears and delivers. And uh, when you look at this uh, chapter of, of this lesson four, mostly the main chapter that I saw from the book of Psalms is in the book of Psalms 121. And uh, where it talks of God's help to those who seek him. Uh, when you seek him in spirit and in truth, there are blessings and benefits of following um, God's law. So in that Psalms 121, when it says, I will lift up my eyes to the, to the hills from where does my help come from? That's where am I going to get my help and where am I going to get my deliverance from? Uh, there is a, you find out that on that one, there is an assurance of God's care. And also, the Lord is our refuge. In the, the Lord reveals himself in scripture as the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. And also, the Lord as a refuge in adversity. The psalmist's testimony, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in him I trust. So when, you, when God delivers us, you find out that at the end result, when you summarize that lesson four, you have peace, there is power to resist sin, you have joy, you have understanding, you have the strength of the Lord, you have freedom, hope, comfort in suffering, you have no shame to talk about the word of God, and you are reverence to God, uh, you have a thankful heart and the worship of her. You have a clean heart. In her, you have a revival. That is the end of that uh, chapter four. Uh, not lesson four, I'm, I'm sorry. Lesson four of the lesson. And when we go to the lesson five, it was saying, singing the Lord's song in a strange land. And you find in that singing, the Lord's song in a strange land is from the book of Psalms 137, whereby we do not need to get into deep uh, into the book of Psalms in order to discover that the Psalms are uttered in the imperfect world. The step of creation ran by sovereign Lord and his righteousness law, his righteousness laws, is constantly threatened by evil, even in our own time. You know, when we are reading the Bible, most of the time we are not reading history. We are reading the Bible, 
and trying to see how it can be applicable to our own life. How is it applicable to save our own souls? Because when we read the Bible, whatever is recorded there is recorded in the past and is recorded for us so that when we read at this time, we are going to use it with the application on how we can save our own brothers, how we can save ourselves as we are waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So as sin corrupts the world more and more, the earth has increasingly become a strange land of God's people. This reality creates a problem for the psalmist. How does one live in, a, in faith in a strange land of corruption, of corrupt people? Wherever you turn around is corrupt. So the song, the Psalms 137, Longing for Zion is, is a, in a foreign land. A song of Zion is also particularly impassioned. Although no author is named for this book when I was looking at it, I tried, whenever I read, I try to see who wrote this and when was what triggered in writing the Psalms. For sure, when I was going through, I don't know, my other brothers, I tried to look at it, but the author of that book is not named clearly. But it shares, the book shares itself with the lamentations and despair of those who suffered the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians in that time when it was written. So the troubling Psalms is one of the deeply felt emotions because you can hear the captives who are asking, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? When you talk about that, it's because you know that you are, the people, when you ask yourself, how can I sing the Lord's song in a strange land? In ourselves, sometimes like this, we can have problems and we think that we cannot even afford singing the Lord's song in our troubled, strange land which we are in. But in all that, we have to remember that God is the God who is in control. And uh, its pattern is uh, making a joyful music to the Lord in a foreign land was so difficult that the, captures, the captives refused to make music at all. They took the words of the captors as a taint. But in ourselves now today, when we see what we are in today, for sure, we are in a strange land. We are having, we, can, we sometimes ask, how can we be faithful and how can we praise God in this time? But we have to thank God that we know the word of God is with us and the Holy Spirit is with us. And we can afford to sing the Lord's song in this strange land that we are in. Uh, in our, the sixth one, I would, I've already taken my minutes. I can see that because I timed myself. But the sixth one is, is saying that I will rise. Uh, the sixth one, the, the, the first, if you have le the lessons, the memory first is that for the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy, now I will rise, says the Lord. I will set him in the safety of for which he yearns. When you see uh, in, in, in the conclusion is that power, in conclude, it concludes power, powerfully with an assertion of power for the pure and truthful words of God. The Psalms has five movements in that one. If you see verse one and two, because I'm not going to read, verse one and two is a descriptive of the language of the wicked. Check on the, uh, uh, Psalms 12. And uh, uh, Psalm, uh, verse three and four is prayer of God's intervention. Then if you see on verse five, which is the main verse of that time, is the intervention of God on how he can deliver his own people. Then verse 6 and 7 talks of a characterization of the language of God. And also verse 8 is a reminder of the continuing process of the wicked. Regardless of God's intervention in our lives, still the wicked continues in our lives. And we are battling with the devil until the end of the time. That's why the Bible tells us, pray without ceasing. Because by prayer is when we can um, uh, attack the enemy. And that is when God intervened. And that's when God saw the needy and he said, I will rise. And the devil wonders if there are righteous people left. Then how comes that there are people who are plotting to kill him all the time? David's life in the book of Psalms was a life of running away, was a life of uh, 
trouble and was alive of sin, even when he wanted to do good, you find that he's, he was doing bad. But then he was remembering to come back to God and seek him in prayer. So because the wicked do not uh, submit to any authority or any, anybody, even God himself, they believe they can say and do anything. That's why they taunt and speak idly words to the brethren and discourage other members of the church. So at this time, brothers and sisters, what that one is saying is that when we ask God and when we seek him, he will rise and come to our aid. Thank you. That was lesson four, five, and six. Vincent will summarize for us lesson six, seven, eight, and nine. In three minutes, remember? Uh, happy Sabbath. I want to be as brief as the three minutes themselves itself. And I want to briefly summarize lesson seven, eight, and nine. Lesson seven. The title was, Your Mercy Reaches Unto the Heavens. And we see the psalmist on this lesson saying that he will praise the Lord among the peoples. How and why? Because his mercy reaches unto the heavens and his truth unto the the clouds. So he has witnessed that and is taking that as a testimony to the, le to the rest of the nations. The peoples here means the rest of the nations. And together with that, he will sing to him among the nations as well. Why is he doing that? Again, he has realized that he is spiritually poor and he has nothing to offer. And he has therefore humbled himself because he has recognized who God is and what he's able to do. So, uh, the takeaway thing is, lesson is, as Christians, those of us who profess to be followers of Christ, we should first of all recognize that we are spiritually poor, humble ourselves, and therefore seek him and praise and worship him. That way, he's able to understand and take our prayers and answer them because we know God's mercy as is everlasting, as is evidenced in God's creation and in the history of God's people. We've see, we know what he has done before. He has delivered the Israelites from captivity. He has restored the broken relationship between man, man and him. And therefore, that alone is what is an evidence that his mercy is everlasting, will never be terminated by anything, by any sin at all. And finally, we see God has a promise, and that for us, and that promise is eternity. Lesson eight. Sorry. Lesson eight. It is wisdom of righteous living. And from there, what we, we need to understand is he's talking about we should know how we live as Christians. We should not live as people who don't have direction, who are not guided. And therefore, this is where he says God teaches us to number our days to gain the heart of wisdom. Because if we know the number of our days, then we are able to have ourselves know how we should be living and working and serving God within the time frame of the days that we are given or known, which is wise living, that worth of God. That is keeping God's law. Because we know our days are limited. Life is transient, and this, therefore, will lead us to be being obedient 
and faithful to God so that we don't have a waste, a waste of living, time of living, thinking that we have a lot of it at our disposal. So God, I mean, when we seek him to give us the days, to number our days, we are able, therefore, to understand how we are supposed to have ourselves conducted as he wants us to do. Lesson 9, he talks about the rejected stone become by the builders has become the chief cornerstone. And we know all this. It is Jesus himself here. When he came as a Messiah, not everyone else accepted him, especially in his homeland. He was rejected. But later, he became the builder. He became the cornerstone. Uh, as we can see how the life that had been lost, it is the one that he restored and everyone else who accepted it became dependent on him for eternity. And therefore, this cornerstone here is salvation. And his work as a cornerstone is revealed in salvation which was brought about through the restoration of our relationship with God through the sacrifice and crucifixion at Calvary. Psalms reveals the, 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 the Christ's deity, his censorship, his sonship, his obedience, his seal for God's temple, his identity as the God, good shepherd, and his betrayal by his own people, and his um, second advent, when he comes to take us to the whole kingdom of heaven. And therefore, this, all this brings it together to qualify him as a cornerstone that became, I mean, as a, as, 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 as a the rejected stone that became the, 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 the cornerstone by the builders. Because without all this that we are seeing here, then it could not have qualified him to be the builders, I mean, to be the cornerstone of our lives as we see in his second coming when he will come, that the fulfillment of God's promise uh, to take us to the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. You can remind us lesson 10, 11, and 12. Yeah, I want to go quickly to lesson 10. Lesson 10 was saying that lessons of the past. Lessons of the past was about how, Christ, how God used to do for the children of Israel. It was a reminder that they were to remember those. And in the acts of worship, you are to remember what God has done for you. That is when you will come to praise him. Actually, the memory first which was there was telling us, it was very clear, which was saying, which we have heard and known, our fathers have told us we will not hide them from their children, telling to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and the wonderful works that he has done for us. The many things that God has done for us, are we telling it to our children so that our children can tell their children and their children to tell the other children and the generation to continue like that? That is the question. The lesson number 11 was saying this, that longing for God in Zion. Why are we longing for God in Zion? We are longing for God in Zion because of what he's doing for us and what he will, doing for, he will do for us. He's going to relieve us from the pain and the suffering that we are going through here on earth. Because when we will be there in the presence of God, we will not feel anything. We will not feel rejected by anybody. We will not feel anything that is affecting us in any way. And the book of Psalms 84 verses 2 was telling us that my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Are we crying out for the living God? He wants us to cry to him. David is telling us that 
we need to long for the presence of God each day. As we long for the Sabbath to come, we need to do the same. Lesson 12 was reminding us and telling us that worship that never ends. We all know we are practicing for the worship that we will be doing with our Father in heaven forever and ever. Remember, there is the 24 elders in heaven who are worshiping day and night. 24, 7. Worshipping who? Our God. So it is a practice that we as the children of God are supposed to do when we are living in this world. The book of Psalms 104, 33 was saying, I will praise the Lord as long as he lives. As, as long as I live. So it is a testament that me and you, we are to praise God as long as we live. What is controlling us from doing that? I will say this, we feel a sense of God's presence when we come to the church every Sabbath to worship our God. Is it true? When we come to the house of God, do we feel the presence of him in the house of the Lord? You know, nowadays we have turned the house of God to be a social club. That is why we don't see it to be a presence of God. But David is reminding us, when we were looking at our lesson last week, we saw that the house of God is a house of worship, is a house of hope, is a house where we feel the presence of God. It's different from our homes. When we come from there to here, we come here to find that it's like a place of our refuge as the children of God. So it's a place where we come to surrender ourselves we saw that one of the acts of worshiping our God is lifting up hands. What is the meaning of lifting up hands? We lift up hands surrendering. When the police is pursuing somebody who is a criminal, when he surrenders, what does that tell him? That now he has accepted, we can go and take him. If they were killing him, will they kill him? No. So it is an act of us surrendering to our God. Let us surrender to our God in praising him. Thank you. Thank you. Lesson number 13. Wait upon who? Thank you. So this is, I'm going to take two minutes to introduce our lesson today. One, our Christian walk is a walk about waiting. One, we are waiting for our Lord, who is our king, who is our maker, and who is our righteous judge. Number two, we are waiting for our God, for deliverance, for salvation, and for forgiveness. Number three, we are waiting for the Lord, for his works of deliverance. And as we wait... The Bible beseeches us to wait and be of good courage as we wait. And as we wait, let's keep our hope alive. It is hope for a better tomorrow. It is a hope for a better future. It's a hope for a better life. And it's a hope for restoration of Canaan as it was before the advent of sin. That as we wait, let's wait on the Lord. Let's wait with humility. That's what we studied in Psalms 131. As we wait, let's wait with humility. Psalms 126. As we wait, let's not only wait in good times, but also be ready to wait in difficult times. Number three, let's wait for our redemption. Because we say we are waiting for the second advent of who? Jesus Christ. The second advent is waiting for our redemption. And as we wait, we are waiting for that glorious morning that we read in Psalms 143. Now, on Sunday, we are being called to wait for the Lord. When you wait for something, there are three characteristics you need to have when you wait. First is patience. Some people, when they wait for a few minutes, they say, I'm becoming what? Impatient. But as Christians, we are told we wait with patience. Number two, we wait with endurance. And number three, 
we wait with the perseverance. Unless we persevere, we will give up. The other thing we are being told is that as we wait, we are waiting for the growth hope. It is a hope, and the kind of Christian waiting we are talking about, we wait longingly. We wait longing. If you did an exam and you are waiting for the results, it can go either way. That is not the same kind of wait when we wait for our Christ. It can't go another way. Christ is coming. That is a blessed assurance. It's not like you are waiting for your test, which can come with fail or pass. We wait because we are waiting for a second advent. And the last statement I want to make. This waiting is not idle wait. We are not called to wait idly. It's not waiting, passive waiting, where you sit down. Like, you know, when you go to the bus stage, you just sit and do what? Wait for the bus. Is that the kind of waiting we are talking about? No. In Christian waiting, we are told to wait and labor. We wait and we also labor for who? We labor for Christ. So we are told to wait, we wait and labor. Number two, we are told to wait and witness for God. And lastly, we are told to wait because when we are waiting and we wait and we run the race and we keep the faith, the result can only be positive. That is Sunday and the introduction. So on Monday, Sister Josephine, in two minutes. Um, I think my brother just kind of summarized uh, the lesson on the waiting. But uh, when we go to Monday, peace of a wind child. Peace of a wind child. And the question that you can see on your lessons is asking, what does the psalmist teach us about our relationship with God? In one answer, if you read that simple, small, first chapter of 131, is trust. The answer will be trust. Uh, because if you see in that psalms, if you, in verse 1, in the simple terms, the term is humility. It's talking about humility. And verse 2, if you look at it in one sentence, it will be a portrait of, uh, of trust. When verse 1 is talking about humility, the second verse will be talking about um, a portrait of trust. And then the verse 3 will be having in like a, a call for hope. So in that chapter, what we see is uh, humility, trust, and uh, a call for of hope in, in a summary. But when he's talking about uh, wait, waiting and also peace of a wind child, for those of us who are families and uh, all of us, I think, when I look at the congregation, we have children. You see a child who has not been wind, they run after their mother because they cannot do anything for themselves. They are just, whenever the mother is not there, they are anxious and uh, if they are hungry, they can't feed themselves. They can't do anything for themselves. But now here it says, peace of a wind child. When, you are, when a peace of a wind child, in this case, it means that now I can do things for myself. Now I can trust, I can have trust. And the child who is wind, in, in this case, when the, the writer was giving us this, God's people live in a world that afflicts and, uh, the faithful, a world full of temptation and hardship, for almost everyone. And a refreshed conviction that he is a child of God and dependent on God for his life consoles the psalmist and brings him to confess that his pride had no value. The deceitfulness of pride is that it causes the proud to become self-centered and unable to look beyond themselves. The proud are thus linked to the higher reality of God blinded of God. So in this case, when you see David was uh, saying that in verse 1, my heart is not haughty. David presents himself with genuine humility, a delicate balance between self abasement and arrogant pride. Because, you know, you have to have balance between 
when you have to be seen, when a pride person, if you have met one, they know that they can do things for themselves. They can even step on you and they can't even say sorry because what can you do, you know? But in this case, David found out that he cannot do anything for himself except relying on God. That's why he came in with humility. And then he, tr he had trust. That's why he had trust in God. And in that one, you, you, meanwhile, the metaphor in Psalms 131, uh, verse 2, like a wind child with his mother, it is a powerful image of one who finds calmness and who is quieted in the embrace to embrace God. It points us to the relationship of a mother and a child. When you trust in God, there's no child who doesn't trust the mother. Anything you know that your mother knows best. Your mother cannot do anything wrong. So as Christians, we have been like, David likened himself that he, he can, the, the writer here is telling us that we can be likened like a mother, a child who has been weaned is calm. In God, we are calm and we have trust, but we have been reminded that we have to come to God in humility. We have to humble ourselves. And we know that those who are in God, they cannot be bride. You cannot be proud and be in God. You have to humble yourselves. And as Christians, we have to be with each other when we know that we are in the lesson, if you read down there, it, the psalmist's attention at the end rests on the well-being of God's people. Ultimately, we are called to use our experience with God to strengthen the church. If we use, uh, that, is, uh, that is from what we have learned personally of God's faithfulness and goodness, we can share this with others who, for whatever reason, still struggle with the, their faith. Our witness about Christ can even be within the church itself, where many need to know him for themselves. Because if in our church, that's why when we read the Bible, we have to get it applicable to ourselves today. When we are reading it, how can we, can we apply what we read in the Bible to our lives today? When it, with each other, how can we help each other to know God, to trust in him, to know that we have learned as children who are not wind, we can trust that it is only God that we can learn to. And as Christians, we have to help each other so that we can run the race as we are waiting for his second coming. Thank you. Vincent, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves or bringing in the crops. As we find it in Psalms 126, quickly I'll go through it. It says, when the Lord brought back the captive, the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who continually goes forth weeping, bearing seed for sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Actually, verse 126, verse 5 and 6, it's where today's lesson is, today's, Tuesday's lesson is centered. And then we see, the, 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 the psalmist uh, saying, when we think about the Lord's miracles in the past, we feel hope for the future. Because our problems now, our troubles and pain should not be a source of discouragement. Because we have seen this happen to previous forefathers, the Israelites, and God has acted. And we have seen in the previous lesson studies that God's mercy is everlasting. His love is, endures forever. And also, 
is, uh, is faithful. And therefore, because he loves us, he's must, he's must uh, uh, being everlasting, and his love endures forever. Therefore, whichever pain we go through, whichever uh, trouble that we are in, is able to come and uh, deliver us. And that is why he's given us this hope that no matter how much we are um, troubled in pain, he is still there for us. He will never abandon us. And therefore, as God's people, if we should trust and have faith in him, that he has done it before, and therefore, he is going to do it. Remembering the past, therefore, gives God's people hope in hard times. That is in Psalms 26, verse 4. The people, the people pray, So, Lord, bring back the good times, like the same as the desert stream filled again with flowing water. Next, the poet uses a word picture about planting seeds in a sad time and collecting crops in a happy times. We all know so those of us who have been in the fields uh, planting or plowing and planting and tendering for crop. During that period, for sure it's a period that is full of pain because sometimes you are not aware whether the rains will be there. You are not aware whether the diseases will come and wipe away your crops. You are not aware that the swarm will come by and uh, wipe away your crop as well. But you trust and hope for the best. God comes in and finally, when you see the harvest time has come, that is when your heart settles down and you are very happy. So times of pain, it is where we are asked to trust and remain faithful as Christians. This word picture shows us a powerful promise that God will lead his people from hard times to a happy future. I know some of us, we are going through various difficulties in our lives. Sometimes we have issues. I mean, we have had people say, where were you, God, when this was happening? Or where is this God? And sometimes this has led some people leaving God or leaving the church. But as Christians, because God himself, he serves for us, he, he takes pain to give us um, an ear and is waiting upon us as well as we are supposed to to wait upon him, we should keep on trusting and being faithful, knowing that, of course, he has done it before, and therefore, he will do it again, even for me, or for you, or for us all. So, the people worked hard, as I've said, planting seeds and plowing their fields, orchards, and grape gardens. They took good care of their crops, their fruit trees, and fines. What is happening here? As a farmer, you know what it takes to have a good harvest. You plow your field, prepare your fields well, pick the best seed, plant it, care for it, and wait for the harvest. At the same time as Christians we are, we are farmers in the name of being good Christians. What are we supposed to do? We are supposed to ensure that our hearts, our minds, our social life is clean and off of any evils. So that way when Jesus Christ comes, he will find a good crop to harvest, not a crop that is sick in terms of our spiritual life. In the same way, God's people work hard for his kingdom now. Their sufferings and hard times will be rewarded soon when he comes for the second time. God will give them the crown of life at the end of time. Then their hearts will be filled with joy. Though we are suffering, though we are in pain, troubles around us, when God comes, God will wipe our tears and crown us with eternal life. And therefore, but we must wait until then, just as we must wait for crops to grow, we must wait to see all the wonderful things that will happen because of the work we do now for God. So the question is, are we having, I mean, are we doing that work for God that we do every day? Is there anything that we don't do that is right, that will make our crops fail, our harvest not to be plentiful, 
so that we have nothing to bring in. So that is what I had for today's lesson. Um, Wednesday, waiting in God's Sabbath rest, uh, the main chapter that we were going to read from that is chapter, Psalms chapter 92, and the question which is asking over there is, what two aspects of the Sabbath day are highlighted in the song for the Sabbath day? In summary, when I was uh, looking in that, because of time, we can see we talk about creation and redemption. Those are the two highlighted aspects that I found when I was reading on that uh, chapter. And uh, because we are not going to read the, the book of uh, Psalms 32, uh, 92, but you can read it for yourselves, I kind of uh, put it down as two words from, from summarizing it. First, one to four you find it's an encouragement for the people to respond to God in praise and worship. And when you see verse 5 to 9, in summary, if you were going to summarize it and put it in one sentence, I could just put it like, it's a celebration of the wisdom of God in bringing judgment to the wicked. And when you go to first, um, just summarizing that chapter of 92 is... Uh, from verse 10 to 11, it is an acknowledgement of the mercy of God who has established the believer, the believers in the present life. And also to the end of it, sorry, my paper, sorry. number four, from now where there is a the percent of that chapter from verse 12 to 15, you find out that if you read it, it is talking basically on the anticipation of the mercy of God that will continue in the life to come. Uh, if you read in that uh, verse 12 to 15, it is says, The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruits in all age, and they shall be fresh and flourishing and green. They, to declare that the Lord is upright, is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. So it, it, that, that's the only way I could summarize that uh, chapter 92 uh, because of time, but you can read your Bibles and see but in a nutshell, that's how th that chapter is. The acknowledgement of, uh, for the pe people of God to praise and worship God. And also to have wisdom in how God is bringing judgment. And also that we have to acknowledge that our God is merciful. Even in our old age, when we have learned the word of God, in our old age, we can still flourish. Because we know that God is the one who has taken care of us all the time and some of us we are still here because even when we were young we knew that God is the only one that we worship is our creator so in that chapter as uh, it was asking what two aspects of the Sabbath are highlighted in this song for the Sabbath day it is to praise the Lord for his love and faithfulness thank you John. Right. Two minutes. enjoy comes in the morning to go back to uh, the book of Psalms 27, 14. The Bible says this, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. Number one, be of good courage. Number two, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. So there is two things I wanted us to learn from the lesson for today. I will say this, let us be of good courage. And Thursday says, Joy comes in the morning. Why is joy coming in the morning? Remember, when Christ was put in the tomb, it was a time of darkness to the disciples. Because they didn't know what to do. They knew that now theirs has finished. But 
when morning came, when those women went to the tomb, they found that Christ is not there. They were saddened again. But they found a boy seated next to the tomb, and they told them, what are you looking for? They found that she has already been, he, he has already been taken. What does that tell them? They, they went, and on the way, he found them. They were joyful. They were very joyful because they knew that the Savior has risen again, that now their issues will be resolved. I want to say this. Joy, when it's coming in the morning, is the time of redemption. It's the time of joy. It's the time of favor, as I can say. And it's the time when despair and trouble comes to an end. Even us right now, we are suffering. But our time is coming when our, suf our suffering will come to an end. That is when our Lord Jesus Christ is coming the second time. We can say much, but I will say this. We expect relief and comfort in the morning because everything has passed away. Dead has gone, sickness has gone, suffering of any kind has gone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now. Okay, we'll start with our sister Pam, we'll go to our brother Richard, and Elder Christina. Uh, yes, happy Sabbath. One each. Happy Sabbath. I think we over summarized the lesson. Um, so, uh, looking at bringing in the sheaves, uh, the Israelites were, were told to bring in the first fruits of their harvest and uh, they were supposed to bake it without unleavened bread. And this reminds them of uh, their exodus from, e from Egypt. When they were taken out of Egypt, they had a doorpost and the blood of Jesus saved them from the calamity that was coming on them. So here we see that uh, Matthew is telling us the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. It's the same God that delivered, that has anointed us to be here, to, to bring many to his kingdom. And then about, um, about the, the Lord's Sabbath, uh, I am just surprised that uh, next time let's not do this because we, we over summarized keeping the Sabbath holy that we may know it's a sign between us and God. So when God anoints us, remember that oil of anointing that Samuel, even Saul himself, was anointed with the oil of gladness. When God anoints us, First Peter uh, 1 uh, 19 said that we are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, who have been declared to take out the praises of our God. And, and, uh, okay. The, the last Pam. comment I want to make here is about the, the joy coming in the morning. And if you read, uh, about that, uh, uh, the quotation of his word there, uh, from uh, Desire of Ages, it says that they are depend dependent recipients of the life of God from the highest seraph to the humblest animal being are all replenished from the source of life. Only he who is one with God could say, I have power to lay down my life and I have power to take it again. In his divinity, Christ Thank possessed you. the power to break the bond of death. So even though we know that in this life we are bound with many things, Christ has power. He has given us power. The angel is shouting to the churches and saying, we are the offspring of David. We are the, all of us who are anointed by God to carry this gospel. There was a, a passage that I wanted to read which said, let me not embarrass my, my God. Because we could be here and we could be embarrassing God by, by not allowing ourselves to 
receive the Holy Spirit of God because we remain children forever. We are not winning. Thank you, thank you. Winning means that we have studied deeply the righteousness of Christ has dwelled in us so we can take it to others. Thank you, Richard. Uh, thank you. I would make a summary like this. Throughout the lesson that we have done this quarter, there is a common denominator, which is praising God in all situations. When you are down, God is down with you. When you are up, God is up with you. When you are in battle, God is in battle with you. When you are in pain, God is paining with you. And I like the way Thursday summarizes it all. Joy comes in the morning. And when morning comes, you forget about the pain that you went through uh, in the night. And the same thing, all through the book of Psalms, David and others, their lives went up and down. But at the end of it, they praised God, they sang. Thank you. Machuka. Yes, um, uh, wait upon the Lord is, uh, thank you, brother. Wait upon the Lord is a command to, the, to God his children. Uh, God, he emphasizes, I say again, wait. See, this is where the children of God gets strength. This is where the children of God matures in, in their relationship with God. They shall not be like children who demand milk all the time. This is the time when they shall start eating hard food. And eating hard food means this is the time Christ is in you to take, through, to take you through tribulations. Because we also welcome tribulations because this is where we build a character. Um, wait upon the Lord. If I can uh, allow me to read only one verse in the book of Isaiah chapter um, 30. Um, 40, uh, for, uh, sorry, for, 40 first, that, for the, that one, it says, um, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall be weak. They shall walk and not, and not do what? And not faint. Uh, practically, for us children of God, we live in a time that we have temptations all around us. And uh, we, de we desire so many things which we shall not carry to heaven. We desire this and that. And this is where our weaknesses is. We desire that. We, de we desire this. Our flesh is weak because uh, it, it is tested with the things around. In these things, we do not gather the strength. We do not wait. God is telling us, wait, because all those things we desire, they make us weak. But, the, but if we wait means... We, are, we, 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 we make ourselves numb to the things around us. And because of this, Thank many you. of the children of God have become weak because they desire many things around us and we have become so weak. We can't serve God. We can't be strong. Thank you. Thank you. Let's stand up, all of us. The next quarter is great. That's the next lesson from to this evening. Get in touch with your teachers. Teacher Pam, I think, should have lessons for her group. Kennedy. Kennedy and Pam should be able to give lessons to that group. Dan has for his class, I believe, aggregate lessons for the other class so that we continue. Shall we pray? A mighty and everlasting God, thank you for reminding us that our walk is a walk where we need to wait patiently and persevere in the Christian walk. May we not grow weary because we know in you, you are our all in all. As we proceed to the ordinance that you gave us, Holy Communion, May you wash our hearts. May you wash our ways and may you direct our paths on righteousness. For this is my humble prayer in Jesus' name.